The book of Galatians is interesting because it's a very critical letter. Um, it's different than any of his other letters. If you look at the greetings in Romans or to the Ephesians or um, the Corinthians or you know any of Paul's epistles, um, this is a very critical letter. And his language is pretty strong. Um, he's still saying, like, grace and peace be to you, but I'm going to speak in a, you know, a disciplined type of way. And I've been chopping at the bit to get to this. So um, I want to get to it, but before I dive in to Galatians, I want to take a look at Acts, the book of Acts, because I believe it's going to have a lot of context that we need that will help bolster um, understanding of why Paul had to write this letter uh, in this way. So if you have a Bible... We're going to be in Acts 7 and 51. Uh, so this is the martyr of Stephen. And if you don't know who Stephen is, he was uh, appointed by the Twelve as one of the seven, right? And he was a man of God. And if you don't know who Stephen is, when you have time, read Acts one through eight, and, but I'm happy to give you the cliff notes right now. So again, uh, man of God, he was doing signs and miracles and wonders, and then he gets accused of blasphemy, gets sent to an, un, an unfair trial where he proceeds to go through a, a history lesson of, of the word and um, claiming Jesus is Christ and pointing out the hypocrisy of the leaders of that time at the council. And this is where we're going to pick it up in Acts 7.51. So he's on trial here, and he, he continues on. He says, you stiff neck and uncircumcised in hearts and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your father not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. You have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed at their, their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And this really ticked them off. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran at him with one accord, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Enter Saul. It's interesting. So the witnesses, these are the guys that are stoning Stephen here. They lay their clothes down at the feet of Saul because they don't want their clothes to get splattered with blood and have this guy's, you know, blasphemous sins on their material. So they say, hey, Paul, I'm going to lay my clothes down at your feet. And I, and I just imagine, and this is, you know, this might have happened this way or not, I don't know. But I just imagine Paul at the time, like, has anybody seen Gladiator, the movie Gladiator? Remember Commodus? You know, and he's like, I just imagine Paul just like, yeah, you know. I'm sorry, Saul. He's Saul right now. Not Paul yet, Saul. I just imagine him going like this. Like, yeah. And if you go on, it says that he consented to his death. In chapter 8, it says, At this time, a great persecution rose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they all were scattered, the Christians, all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Entering every house, huh, every house, jeez, 
and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Yeah, this is Paul. This is Saul before his conversion, right? This is who he was. So if you ever think that or know anyone, it's like, man, I'm not good enough. You know, I've done, like, look at, actually, you can look at any story, Peter and Paul and Moses. But Paul, Saul, he was the guy that was, had Peter stoned. He was the man that held the clothes of the people that did it, that consented to it, said, yes, let's do it. I agree. Kill him. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to gather up everybody. Every, I'm going to go into houses. I'm going to kick down doors and drag them out. This is who he is. The Galatians know this. They know this story. Okay? So let's look at chapter 9, Acts. And this, might be, this should be on the, uh, on the screen here. Chapter 9, verse 1. It says this. We're going to fast forward a little bit. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found anyone who were of the way, of the way of Jesus Christ, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Just so we understand what that means to kick against the goads. You know, they had oxen, and the, this, the goads is what the oxen had around their necks. So in my mind, I'm just imagining an affinity amount of goads, oxen with goads around their neck. They're plowing ground, right? And you have this one guy, Saul, that's like trying to stop an affinity number of oxen that's going to plow the ground. He's like, so Jesus is saying, listen, you're kicking against my message. It's like, this is going to happen. My message is going to go forth, and you're trying to kick against it. So it's hard, yeah, it's impossible. So he said, verse 6, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I love this right here. Pause for a second. He heard and obeyed, right? That's what we are to do. We hear and we obey. Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then then Saul rose from the ground, and and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So then the story goes on, Ananias baptizes uh, Saul, you know, the scales fall off his eyes, and then he goes on his mission. And so we're painting a backdrop. So that's the context that we enter into Galatians, right? So with that as the backdrop, which the Galatians should know, the church of Galatia, right? Now we read Galatians 1 through 5. We'll do 1 through 5, and we'll start there. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. First off, why did Paul have to write this letter? We need to address this. So Paul wrote this letter to counter the Judaizing false teachers. Judaizing just means to be made Jew. Um, This might be a misnomer, according to N.T. Wright, because 
Judaizing means actually a Gentile trying to become Jew. But these, maybe we can call them Jewish Christian false teachers that are saying you need to do these things to really be a Jew. Either way, I think it's semantics. That's up to you. You can, you can decide. But these false teachers were undermining the um, doctrine of justification uh, by faith, grace through faith, right? They were saying, great, you found Jesus. That's good. Paul told you about that. But, we, but that's not the whole story. That's not the whole story. You also need to do, you know, follow the whole Mosaic law. Um, you need to get circumcised. We're going to put these burdens on you, and you got to do these things to really be in the family of Christ, right? And so this is what they were teaching. They were spreading this, um, this heresy. And why were they teaching this? This is the interesting thing to think about. Um, and a lot of scholars say, you know, it could be as simple as, you know, their, it affected their Jewish, um, their Jewish status. It affected their status with the Roman Empire. So at, the, at that time, the Roman Empire, um, right, they were worshiping uh, the goddess Roma, right? They had their gods, you have to, you have, their gods, you have to, your pagan gods, you had to worship. They had, um, you had to worship the emperor and his family. And so you have the, the Jews that they found out that they could not make. You could try to make them worship their pagan gods, but they're not like, no, we're not going to do that. You can kill us. And so the Romans being practical, and I'm giving the G-rated version of this because my daughter's watching, so I'm not going to go into all the violence. But um, so basically, you know, they, uh, they say, okay, well, we will allow you to do that. But you need to pray to your God for us. And they say, okay, we'll pray to your God, our God, for you, but we're not going to pray to you. And they say, okay, this is a good relationship. That happens. So what happens is when Jesus comes in, and now anybody can be a Jew by grace through faith. They ain't got to do any of these religious things. So you could be blonde hair, blue eyes, European, and be a Jew. You can be African-American descent, dark skin, brown eyes, and be a Jew. This is kind of a problem if you really look at it, because now if I'm, you know, a Roman, and I'm like, wait a second, you don't even have to be of the same ethnicity to be a Jew. So now anybody can be. So they can just say, Oh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm Jew now, so I'm not going to worship your pagan gods. It's almost like, it's almost like you have, and if, if this is you, that's totally fine, right? It's totally fine. But people that have dogs, right, and they say, you know, this is my, um, you, they get to take it on a plane because it's their emotional dog, but it's really not their emotional dog, but it's like a loophole, and it's like, you know, so you see all these dogs on the plane, like, man, I, I want to take my dog. What do I got to do? Oh, you gotta, all you got to do is say it's an emotional, you know, it's emotional support. Really? Oh, okay. You know, and they're like, if we let this go on, then that would be bad. You're right? <laughs> it would be bad. So the Jewish, right, false teachers are like, okay, it could be as simple as that. I mean, there's, there's debates, but they're like, maybe they were not necessarily evil, but they're like, you know what, we're going to put all this other stuff on because burdens on them. This is what you have to do to really become Jew. The point is, is that Paul, we disagree with him. He's wrong. That's what they are saying. And they're trying to add all these burdens on. And so Paul says, he's already came. He's already told them that you don't have to do any of this. You already, you already have Christ through justification by, by faith. You already believe. Like I've, already, I've already went to you. And so if you look at verse 3, you have all that as a backdrop. Now you look at verse 3, and he's like, he says, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this evil present age. So basically, if so, if salvation is by works and not grace, how can anyone be 
sure that he is secure in eternity in heaven, right? If I have to do all these works that the false teachers are saying, how can I know that I've done more than anyone else? You can't. And see, Paul doesn't mince his words here. It's a direct attack to what these guys are preaching. Remember, they were spreading that, one, you need to be a Jewish convert. Two, you need to submit to the whole Mosaic law. And then you can become Christians or Jewish Christians. If you look at verse 4 and 5, he reminds them where their grace comes from. Right? That's what, that's what that means when he says, where does your grace come from? Grace comes, he says, grace to you and peace from who? God. And who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. So, they know this. So now, all that they already know. And then this is why he's so baffled. Right? So if you go into, we look at verse 6 now. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. I marvel. I am baffled. I don't understand why you want to add, add things when you don't have to. I think I understand, though. I think... I believe that, you know, it just makes, this doesn't make sense. It's hard to swallow that, that all we need is Jesus. It's like, you know, how do I separate myself from my neighbor, Joe? Because, you know, Joe is, you know, he does X, Y, and Z. And, or how do I separate myself from my neighbor, Debbie? You know, I'm better than them. I'm better than he is. So I got to work. So maybe if I do more work, I don't, I'm not, no, God is impartial, Right? No, we got to add something. We got to be able to do. I got to be able to work. I must do something. That's why I think they got persuaded. And the church, they voluntarily deserted the grace of God to pursue a legalistic doctrine, which is why he was. He's like, why would you want to, that's false, one, A, and also you don't have to do any of that stuff. You don't have to get circumcised. You don't have to follow all this. It, all you have to do is look to Christ. Look at verse 8 and 9. So he goes on, he says, but even if we, myself, or an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel than what you have preached. Let him be accursed. As we have said before, I now say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. He said it twice. In that, back then they needed to do this. I've said this before, but they needed to do this. This meant like in our... In our culture, right, in our, in our, we would probably highlight it or we would make it bold in a statement back then. They didn't, have, they didn't have that, so they would repeat the same statement, which means, hey, pay attention to this. So anytime you hear Jesus say something twice, like, oh, that's like putting parentheses, that's like putting bold, that's like, hey, pay attention to this right here. I'm saying it twice. And this is, you know, Paul's point is like a hyperbolic, hyper, it's like exaggerated, it's, He's like, this doesn't even make sense. I'm just going to say this fictional overstatement, right? Because there's no way an angel from heaven, the chances of an angel from heaven or myself preaching something different to you is almost impossible. But it's so serious that if I do it, let myself be accursed. Now, the Greek word for accursed is anathema, which means devoting someone to destruction and eternal hell. So he's basically saying, I will devote myself to eternal damnation if I teach 
anything other than what you've heard me say before or what you've heard the apostles say. If there's one thing that we should be doing and what they should have done, is contending for the faith. You always want to contend for the faith of Christ. Right? Testing what people teach and what people preach, including myself. And what you hear from me. How do we do this? How do we test what people say? Let's look at 1 John. 1 John 1, 4, verse 1. First John 4 says this, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world. There's the Holy Spirit, and there's other spirits that are against the Holy Spirit that influence others that say, hey, this is this is, yeah, this is, yeah, you need Jesus plus this, or yeah, this is the way. And it's a tick off. Like, this is the truth. And then it'll be, they were just tick off. They're adding legalism. But then you walk down that road, and then you're way off, right? Because then, if you add legalism and I'm doing more work than somebody else, now I see them not doing the same work that I'm doing. Now I get bitter towards them. Now I'm not esteeming my neighbor higher than myself, which is what we should be doing. But no, I'm esteeming myself higher than my neighbor because I'm better, because I do more work. You see how that can get twisted. You see, we, need, we should have a healthy skepticism regarding any teaching. We are called to be students of the word. We should be examining the scriptures to determine what's truth and what's error. The Galatians... Obviously, the church in Galatia obviously did not do this. Um, they were so flippant with the gospel, um, like a child with a lighter. They're going to start a fire. It's going to lead to destruction. That's what's going to happen. If you wait long enough, that's what it leads to. The word that they received was easily choked out of them. I start thinking of the parable of the soils. And I'm like, why? Like Paul, like he's, he's marveled that, that they left so easily. Like that, hmm. I instantly thought of when I was reading through this, I was like, hmm, the parable of the soils. You guys remember that, that parable? You know that, right? Mark 4. Verse 3, listen to this. Mark 4, verse 3 says this. And this is Jesus speaking. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some of the seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came down and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of the earth. And when the sun came up, it was scorched. Because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell amongst thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded up a crop and sprang up, increased, and produced some 30-fold, 60, and some 100-fold. The disciples don't understand this. They say, Jesus, what does this mean? And he explains it in verse 13. If you look for it, a few verses. He says, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? 
Verse 14, the sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside which the word was sown. When they hear, Satan comes and immediately takes it away, the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise, the ones sown on stony ground, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves. And so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these ones, now these are the ones sown among thorns, which are the ones who hear the word. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires of other things enter in and choke out the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground, who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some thirty, sixty, and some a hundredfold. This is what I believe was happening in Galatia. See, since these false teachers sought to undermine Paul's spiritual credentials, he defends his position and the difference between the false teachers and himself. In verse 10, and I'm going to wrap it up with this because I believe this is the crux of the matter. And it's a question that we should be asking ourselves. So let's look at verse 10. We have it up on the, we don't have it up there. It's okay. Galatians 1, verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Notice that he says, if I still please men, which means that's what he was doing before, right? That's what he was doing when he's dragging out Christians, men and women from their houses. He was pleasing his superiors. He was pleasing men. This was before he was converted. He was Paul of Tarsus from the tribe of Benjamin. He was like, do you know who I am? I'm, I'm, I'm Saul. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm, you know how many Christians I've dragged out? Houses? I'm sure he said that out loud after he was converted and said, man, that sounds ridiculous. That is, I did that. Which is another reason why I think Paul goes for me so hard, like, for Christ. Like, he is, like, because of what he did. And he's like, man, Christ still gave me another chance after I was dragging his people out. He, he says, I will do anything, anything. I will go anywhere. Here I am, Lord. I think this is the question that we need to ask ourselves. It lies right here in verse 10. Do we seek to please men or do we seek to please God? Simple question. Sit with it. Think about it. Examine it. Do I care what others think about myself? You care what others think about you? You care what others think about your social status, your social media, how many likes you have? Or do we seek to please God before everything else? This needs to be our motivation. This needs to be our motivation in every situation is first Christ before anything else. Our vision needs to be up every day, every hour, day, month. You guys get it, right? It says, first seek ye the kingdom of God, and then everything else will be given to you, right? Either You'll be given a bunch of likes on your social media, or you'll be like, man, this is not as important as I thought. You'll be either given a lot of social status, 
but it won't matter to you because you're first seeking the kingdom of God. This needs to be us. Amen? Let me pray. Men, Ben, you could come back up. Heavenly Father, um, we just come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, and we just say that you are creator and we are creature. Uh, you are God, and we are not. Lord, and we, we trust you. We look to you first. Lord, and if we are not doing that, Lord, examine us. Show us where we are not first going to you in every situation. Show us where we are relying on our own strength and our own power to get things done, to move the needle. Um, Lord, we want to consult with you with everything before we do anything. We want to be in step with you, Lord. We don't want to go before you. Lord, we don't want to be behind you, but we want to be right next to you, Lord. We want you near to us. So right now, Lord, I just surrender. You are God, and I am Lord. And Father, we just love you.